yourself with it. You, you're blessing all these preachers and these pastors. God, we will not forget about you. You yes. will not suffer your foot to be removed. All right. Well, I rose to my foot to talk about this beautiful Carmel skin, five, four, seven and a half shoe, American woman. She captured my heart one night in a class whereby I was blessed to be an instructor, and she was a student learning how to go in and minister to prisoners. I said, God, this girl is this fine, and she wants to be a representative of you behind prison walls. I said, Lord, thank you. I'll take her. <laughs> now, in a misogynist or misogynic society, depending on your accent, we often hold women back from doing what God has called them to do. Don't be found guilty with blood on your hands tonight. Let God use you to push her into a realm that she's never seen before. I'm telling you, this is the moment, Pastor, where our mystery will become revelation. Your maturity can go beyond immaturity and beyond maturity to spiritual revelation. Your doubt can become faith. <laughs> I stole that from a friend of mine. Your religion can become relationship. Would you give it up for none other than Elder Christy Lynn Dobbins? Give it up. that you have extended to us and your kindness that you extended to us today. I want to honor Pastor McKenzie who brought us in as well to Birmingham. So we have enjoyed our time here in Birmingham and in London and Croydon. And so we are thankful that God chose all of us in this room to be in this set space and this set place at this appointed time from the foundation of the world. Maybe six months ago, you didn't know you would be here, but God knew that you would be here. He knew you would be here. He knew I would be holding the microphone, and he knew that he put something in my belly to meet your situation, and that if you extend your faith tonight, see, I'm a faith person. You can't do this without faith. The same way that it took you to have faith to get saved, it takes you to have faith to walk this walk. So tonight, I'm calling on your faith. I'm asking you to push me in the spirit. I'm asking you to make a demand on the Holy Ghost. I'm asking that you to wear me out in the spirit. That they have to carry me out because I've given all that I have. I honor all the clergy in the room, the bishops, the pastors, the ministers, the lay helpers, the people that attended. I honor you all, and I thank you for your time. We don't take your time for granted. We're going to go to the word of the Lord. I'm going to read a couple passages of scripture. It is our custom to stand for the reading of the word. I will read some scriptures and others I will relay back to them later on during the sermon. But if you have your Bibles, I ask that you turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15. There is a word in the house tonight. 1 Samuel, chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9 and then verses 26 through 28. When you have it, say amen. 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 Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee, to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus said the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. How he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass, 
And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them and telling them 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get ye down from among the Am Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from amongst the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king yeah. of the Amalekites, alive yeah. and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lamb and that that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused, that they utterly destroyed. Verse 26, and Samuel said unto Saul, yeah, yeah. I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned about to go away, and he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee, this day, and have given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Amen. Father, we ask that you do what only you can do. I decrease, your Holy Spirit increase. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I, I perceive that I'm in the room, well obviously I'm in the room with many clergy. And so I perceive I'm in the room with many people that have been churched and are familiar with their Bible and familiar with their scripture. So I perceive that I am not reading to you a story that is unfamiliar to you. But they teach you when you're training to be a minister that when you use a familiar, familiar text, that you also want to give a revelation that is relevant, that is yeah. new, and that is right, right down. And as I begin to ponder over this text, and I'm just going to say, Pastor, this was not my text when I went to bed last night. All right, all right. So this is a text that the Lord is downloading as I am speaking to you. Lord. Because the Lord has said, you know, we keep saying something. Everywhere I go, I've said it. I've heard other prophets say it. I hear other people say it. That there is a shift coming. That there is a transition coming in the kingdom. And that there is going to be a power change, if you will. But anytime there is transition and that there is change, uh, there is a little intrepidation and fear amongst the people. Yeah. See, generally when you say there is a shift, then there is this group that's happy because they believe they're the ones that's next. But what about the group that is concerned, Lord, am I part of the shift? Am I going to be a casualty of transition. That's our text today. Casualty of transition. Right, See, okay. transition is nothing but change. It is moving from one place to the other. Just as you have had in your recent elections that there have been casualties of transition. Right. Even in America, the prophet, the pastor alluded to it earlier, that there was a casualty of transition of power that we experienced with our elections last year. I would like to say one casualty of that was uh, Hillary Clinton. She had given her all. She went to the best school. She was qualified. She did everything they told her to do. They told her to get the best degree. She stood by her husband when her husband wasn't faithful. She did everything within her power. But yet... She was a casualty of transition. See, sometimes the transition is based upon who was last in power. So Hillary, actually, she was a result. Her transition was halted because there was a group of people that were unhappy with the last person in power. And because she was too familiar to the last person in power, there was a group that rose together and said, we don't want anything that's sounds like him. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And it made her 
a casualty of transition. It made her degrees mean nothing. It made all of her positions, Secretary of State, First Lady of the United States, all of that meant nothing because she was a casualty of her predecessor. Come on. Uh, See, you keep saying that there's a switch and there's a change, but are you able to fully walk out after the person that you're coming behind? Come See, on. it's easy to go in behind somebody that failed, but can you go in behind somebody that succeeded? That's good. That's good. Casualty. I submit to you, by the time we're finished today, we're going to realize we always talk about Saul being Israel's first king and we compare him to David because David was a man after God's own heart and we always criticize Saul because of his inadequacies but I want to back you up to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8 and I, I really don't fully blame Saul because first chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 8 starts with this and Samuel was old <laughs> the prophet Samuel. Come on. If you don't know, in those days, Israel was ruled by judges. Come on, teach Samuel was a judge. I'm going to teach a minute, then yeah. we're going to preach, That's and then we're going to prophesy, and then we're going to lay hands. So Samuel was a judge, and he was a priest. Because he was raised under the high priest Eli, he was raised up by Eli. He was a judge and he was the first prophet. He was a bad prophet because the Bible says that none of his words fell to the ground. You may have your favorite Isaiah, but his words, some obviously fell. Because Samuel is the only prophet that God demarks in the earth realm and says none of his words. Not Ezekiel, who saw the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Not Jonah, not uh not Hezekiah, I mean, not, not Hezekiah, not Zechariah, but Samuel. Samuel. But it was something interesting, and I want to quote it properly. I want to read it to you in your hearing. And it came to pass, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Samuel was old, so he made his sons judges over Israel. See, he earned the right to be judged. He was qualified to be judged, but every now and then you'll look at a leader, and just because now they're old, and they're worried about their succession, and they think it's supposed to come out of their house, and they put an anointing on a child that can't handle it, that hadn't walked it out, that hadn't done what God called them to do. He made them judges. God didn't call them judges. The prophet made them judges. Oh, I know how it is. We have our biblical heroes, and we don't want to think that they did nothing wrong. But I submit to you that Samuel was raised by Eli. Let's back it on up. He grew up in the household with Eli, who was a priest who had rebellious children. I submit to you that Samuel repeated the same thing his spiritual father did, that though he was a great prophet, yeah. he had children he couldn't control. Yeah. Come on. Oh, he's quiet in here. Let me, let me prove it to you. Let me read the next verse. Now the name of the first one was Joel, and the name of his second was Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel, come on elders of Israel, gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, you're old, Samuel. You're old. You can't do this much longer. You're old. And thy sons walk not in our ways. Now make us a king. <laughs> to judges. We criticized them for wanting the king. Come on. But what they were really was saying was don't leave us with your raggedy kids. I don't know if you know what that means over here. But don't, don't, Samuel, you say, but they're not really walking after you. This might not be your biological kids. This might be that spiritual son that you never correct. That spiritual Hello. son that you let run around. That spiritual son that you don't have a wife and a girlfriend. But you determined to make him a judge. 
Right. In my old church, they said it's tight, but it's right. <laughs> Casualty. Casualty. Of transition. Because Samuel is old. Oh. He is dying. It is time to transition power. He's already given it to his sons. He knows they're not worthy. He doesn't argue with them. He actually is very hurt by it. And he goes to God. And he says to God that he's upset because the people don't want a king. But could it be that he's also upset because the people don't want his kids? Oh, that's good. That's good. Y'all gonna check that. So it brings us to Saul. Saul wasn't looking to be king. Glory to God. Saul wasn't asking God to put him over the children of Israel. Saul was from a small tribe. Come Saul on. didn't even think he was worthy. But the people pulled so that God said, let me give you something that you think you want. I submit to you that Saul was a casualty of what the people begged for. Oh. He didn't ask for it. Oh. <coughs> you going to do it anyway? It's good, Elder. God is God, but you're going to do it your way? Yeah. There's going to be a casualty. There's going to be a loss. Somebody's going to lose when you do it your way. Yeah. Yeah. So it brings us to 1 Samuel chapter 15. And Samuel is meeting with Saul, and he's telling Saul that I have now anointed you, and you're king over Israel, but the Lord wants you to go do this thing first. I, I like this because God is God. See, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. So God has in his mind a set time that he is going to avenge everything that has happened to you. So here it is, Saul. This is what I want you to do. You have been anointed king. Go back and get those Amalekites, those people that were mean to my children when they were coming up out of Egypt when my children had already been oppressed. They'd already been mistreated. they finally breaking free and you're going to take advantage of them when they're weak. Go back and kill them and utterly destroy them. That's why you have to be careful when people are coming out of bondage. How you handle them in the yes. church. Because if they're already weak yes. and they're already frail and it took everything they had to get to church, yes. how dare you mistreat them? Yes. Yes. Everybody in that family rejected them. Everybody everywhere they went rejected them. And they finally make it to the house of the Lord. And you treat them like they're nothing. See, the problem is, God is angry. When you mishandle people yes, that are already weak. Yeah. You already know you have an advantage. You already know that you're more educated and more qualified. You already know you have more money. How dare you mishandle them? Because they're weak. Because they just getting by. Because they just not getting their life together at 40 years old. Because they just now. Go back, Samuel. Saul and utterly destroy them. He said, spare nothing. See, that's one thing about God watches how you handle power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the problem. That was the problem with David and Bathsheba. Yes, it was wrong to commit adultery, but it was wrong how he handled his power. You handle your power by putting Uriah, somebody who was loyal to you, on the front line just to cover up your sin. Your character is revealed by how you handle power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, anybody is meek and humble when you're on the bottom. It's when you're on the top that we see who you really are. So God said, destroy them all, spare them not, kill the women, the children, kill everything. So Saul, he, he obeyed. He went and gathered a group of men and they went down and they laid in wait in the valley. The Lord's been speaking to me for months now about the valley. So much happens in the valley. That's why the Lord took Ezekiel down to the valley of dry bones. It is always in a low place that certain things from God are revealed. See, you go up to the mountain, but you can't live there. You got to come back to the valley. How do you survive the valley? See, everybody can shine when you're on the mountain, but how do you walk through? Come on. David said it this way. Yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Go down 
and wait in the valley. But I like how God is. He doesn't leave anyone out because just the way the Amalekites had mistreated his children, the Kenites had showed them kindness. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, was actually a Kenite. So Saul says to the Kenites, separate yourself from the Amalekites. Every now and then to save yourself, you got to separate yourself from those that are on God's hit list. See, you keep worrying about the enemy's hit list, but God has a hit list. Oh, you don't believe he's still a killer. You don't believe just because we are ever in grace that God won't say enough is enough. But if you look around, you will see him saying it every day that it is sinking in his nostrils. Get it over. So the Kenites found favor because they had extended kindness. To God's children. Help. So God cares how you treat them. You extend kindness. Yes. Somebody is saved simply because you were kind to somebody. See, it's going back to the basics, Pastor. The stuff they taught you when you were little. My mama would say it this way. If you don't have nothing nice to say, don't say nothing at all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Kenites show kindness, so he spared them. But here's the problem. Saul and the men began to destroy everything except the king, the one in power. They destroyed everything except the king and the best of the cattle, the best of everything they had to offer. Which meant he was disobedient. Because God said, I want you to utterly destroy it. See, the thing about utterly destroying something is that you go down to the root and you make sure it never come back up. That's the problem. You'll live holy for about four years. But because you kept the king and you didn't bother the king, you tried to kill some of the behaviors, but you didn't go down to the root. You didn't utterly destroy it. So about four years later, the king rides back up and show you I'm king. Oh, you didn't catch that. <laughs> you, you want me to give you some examples? <laughs> you want me to give you some examples? Every now and then, you know you got a lust problem. That's what we all can understand. Every now and then, so you say I'm going to stop sleeping around, but you never pulled it up from the root. You never went back and said I'm this way because it happened in my childhood. I'm this way because somebody touched me inappropriately. So no, you just stop the behavior for a season, but the king rises back up. Because the king is the authority. The king will remind you I'm the king. I'm in control. Satan is a deceiver. He don't mind you thinking you got it together for a season. He don't mind you thinking that you really walking holy for a season. But the king will rise back up if you don't utterly utterly destroy it. He's rich. Did y'all play patty cake when y'all were little? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stop playing patty cake with the devil. Huh, come on, devil dollars. Let's show them what it looks like. You just play with them a little bit. You just play with them a little bit. You play with them, walk toward me, walk toward me. You play with them so much that you're just playing. And you're just playing. And next thing you know, you're all the way over here somewhere God never intended. Kill the king! Kill the king! Kill the king! Kill it. Saul didn't kill it. Why would you keep the king? Uh, why would you keep the king of a group of people that had mistreated the Israelites? Why would you spare the king of somebody that is evil and vile? Why would you keep the king? And all of the choice. The thing about Samuel is, I don't know. See, I grew up with a mother and aunts like Samuel. It didn't matter where you were, what you did. They'll call you in the middle of the night and say, I had a dream. And that's what happened with Samuel the next morning. The Lord woke him up and said, you know what? I told Saul to kill those the king and utterly destroy everything. Get up and go down there and correct him. No, we don't do that anymore. Get up, you say you're a prophet. How you a prophet and all you prophesy houses. Get up and go down and restore order. Restore order. Restore 
Every prophet in the Old Testament restored order. Do you restore order? Yes. See, the problem is the prophets these days are renegades. Therefore, they can't restore order because they're not in order. Oh. Oh. They say things like, oh, they can't handle my anointing over there. Oh. They can't believe the Lord. Oh. You ain't that deep. You're not. You just rebellious. The devil is a lie. Your anointing. It ain't bad enough to kill your king, but you that deep. Wow. Oh, you didn't catch that. Your anointing didn't deliver you, but you keep telling us you so anointed that we don't understand. He's a deceiver. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, let's go right back there. Let me go right back there. Can you get ready to make me go all over my text? Because you know what? Samuel, that's why his words didn't fall. Because he would do whatever the Lord asked him to do. He would say whatever the Lord said. Samuel was so bad that when he walked into the town, the people got scared because they knew God showed up. That's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Not your our entourage, not your clique, not your group, but God. When is the last time that you walked in the room and everybody knew that God showed up? There is coming a time, just like with Elijah, that you can ready to have to prove who you are. You keep saying you somebody that you not. You can ready to have to prove that you for God or if you for Baal. Not by your tongues, not come on, not by your prophecy, but by your life. Preach the word. By your life. By your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Been in church too long. I've been in church longer than you know I have. I've been seeing too many come and too many go. That's why I respect the older elder statesmen because anybody can be great for a season. Anybody can do it for five years. Anybody can do it for 10 years. And can you make full proof for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Samuel was an old man. He was still prophesying because there wasn't nobody to take his place. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Come on. Yes. Jesus. So God spoke to Samuel. And he said, It repented me that I have made him king. That I've made Saul king. And what that means is not that God had to repent like you and I repent. But it was a regret that I have put you in a position that you cannot handle. Because you're walking in a spirit of rebellion. And rebellion, the text say, is as a spirit of witchcraft. So let me tell you something. While you're talking to the witch and while you're talking to the warlock, if you're walking in rebellion, you're talking to yourself. It's all the same. What's rebellion? <laughs> when it's always just you. You can't get along with nobody. You your own company of prophets. You your own group. You your own clique. I thought they only did that in America. But obviously, Pastor, they do that in the UK. Yeah! Jesus. So Samuel rose up early to meet Saul. And God told him where he was. So he went to the place. And Samuel went to Saul and said, 
Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Saul just opened his mouth and Saul started lying. <laughs> See, I don't understand. You know, it reminds me of the New Testament when Ananias and Sapphira came in and lied to the Holy Ghost. See, if God was allowing people to drop like that these days, when they lied to the Holy Ghost, forget about lying to me, forget about lying to him, forget about lying to the pastor, lying the Holy Ghost. This is church. This is church. He's coming back. 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 If you did what you said you did, then why do I hear this bleeding of sheep in mine ears and the lowing of oxen which I have heard? Then Saul made up a lie. You know how Christians do? We give you a scripture and we try to justify it by the word and then we try to make it look like it's all right. But even doing, let me say this, the right thing for the wrong reason is still wrong. I'm going to say it again. Come on. Doing the right thing for the wrong reason is still wrong. Cause you know I shut up. The right thing for the wrong reason is still wrong. Check your motives. Check your motives. Right thing for the wrong reason is still wrong. Still wrong. So Samuel asked him, if you did what I said, then why do I hear? these sheep and these oxen. And Saul says, then Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep. <laughs> As if God wants the best of an evil thing. Wow. Let me tell you. Because in the Old Testament, when the house was cursed, the whole house was cursed. So why do you think you can give God the best of an evil thing? The people kept it, he said. So that they could go back and sacrifice to God. Yeah. How are you sacrificing to God yeah. what God didn't even ask you for? Ooh. It took me back to Cain and Abel because, see, you wanted to sacrifice Cain, that which God had already cursed. You wanted to sacrifice the ground that had been cursed and give it back to God as a praise. The devil is alive. Yeah. Mm. Hallelujah. 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 Verse 18, and the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, this is what Samuel is saying to Saul. God told you to go utterly destroy the sinners. Let's be clear who they are. God told you to destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they would be consumed. Wherefore, then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? But this fly up on the spoil and this evil in the sight of God. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, wow. yeah. but the people, wow. but the people, wow. Elder Braggs, wow. he blamed it on the people. But can I tell you, you will never do what God called you to do if you're listening to the people. If the people's voice is louder than God's voice, you will always fall short of what God called you to do. If the people can tell you to do a thing or not do a thing, and God has already spoken it in your spirit, you will forever be falling short and in disobedience. But the people took all of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the cheaper things which could have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than what? Sacrifice and to hearken than that of the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Samuel goes on to plead his case. But as we get down to verse 26, 
the prophet begins to make it clear. You will not speak to me again. <laughs> Samuel, the prophet, makes it clear. Saul, you will never speak to me again. This is really uh, a picture of the word of the Lord never coming your way again. <laughs> because Samuel was the Lord's mouthpiece. Yeah. Samuel, this is before the cross, so the people did not get their own words. They relied on the prophet. Actually, what Samuel had created was the, was the prophet and the king working together. We saw that even with David. He had Nathan and he had Gad. And he would say, should I go up? Because he wanted to hear the word of the Lord. Should I go up? But he said, you will never see me. Again. And as Samuel turned to go, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and he tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has taken the kingdom from you, I'm translating, of Israel from thee this day, and have given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thine. But I want to go down to verse 32. And let me look at my time to see where we're going in the next few minutes. Because this is what's key about a casualty of transition. God has a set time and a set place and a set people that he needs to be in order. Sometimes the king can't do it. Sometimes the political realm can't do it. Sometimes the powers of be that can't do it. Sometimes God needs the apostle. He needs the prophet. He needs the evangelist. He needs the apostle. He needs the teacher. He needs the bishop. He needs the preachers to get up in line like Samuel. So Samuel did. And he said, bring me King Agag. Bring me the king that you wouldn't kill. Bring me the thing that needs to be utterly destroyed. And you saw the priest, you saw the prophet become a warrior and begin to destroy everything that has stood up against the knowledge of God until the church rises up and get in position and begins to destroy the very things that have stood up in opposition to the movement of God until the church becomes the church, becomes the light, becomes the city, becomes the salt. Don't complain about your government. Get in position. Pick up your sword. Tell them to bring Agag to me. Oh, who is Agag? It's that principality. It's that power that is ruling over your region. It's that generational curse that keeps coming up in your kids. It's that thing, that thing that you haven't got rid of. Ah, he says, bring me hither me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately because he knew he was in the presence of a prophet. So he walked lightly because he knew he wasn't supposed to be alive. And Agag said, surely bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as the sword has made, as thy sword has made women childish, so shall thy mother be childish. Among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord. Then Samuel went up to Ramah, and Saul went up to the house of Gibeah, of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king of Israel. There is a transition coming. There is a shift coming. Actually, it's already started. You already seeing God putting up one and taking down another. But I'm here to tell you, if you're like Saul and you won't utterly destroy everything that the enemy has ever said against you, you will fall in the number. I'm here to tell you that every transition has a cat. Casualty. You better count up the cost before you try to keep doing this thing in your own strength. You better go back to God and make sure he gave you the direction. You better go back to God and solidify your call. You better go back to God and say, did you give me this vision? Come on. Make it play. Because in every transition, 
There is a casualty. For somebody, it's their kids. For somebody, it's their business. For somebody, it's their mind. See, you think it's just about getting a position, but it's about keeping the position. It's about walking in everything that God called you. You've been so worried about doing it yourself that you have not allowed God. So, knew from the beginning, I can mess this up. I'm not worthy. I ain't never been a king. I have never seen a king. What is a king? Nobody in my family is a king. But you the trailblazer. You say you the one. But when you blaze in a trail, you better count up the cost. Actually, Pastor, you should have had to start your own church. Somebody tried to hold up that which God had for you. But the devil is a lie. God is going to do double in my head. Yeah. 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 There was a path already laid for you. There was a transition already designed for you. But somebody, let me say, hey. It's time. It's time. Everything. He ever told you. It's time. Every calling. Every gift. It's time. It's time. Church, are you 
A friend of the world is an enemy with God to God. That's the book. That's the book. Yes, God. Yes. We don't have too many casualties. We don't have too many setbacks. We ain't playing. Don't do it. 
Don't do it. If you don't want the curse on your house, don't do it. London and my UK experience, but if you don't ever ask me back, I'ma get it all out tonight. You messed with the wrong girl, a little girl from the country that stay at church till two and three o'clock at night on the school night. I don't care. write your vision and say everything God gonna give you and when you line it up like an accountant with debits and credits with debit is that what you owe it credits is that which is coming in go ahead on the credit side and put everything that God has promised you and everything he says coming to pass but on that debit side I need Come you to on, put Elijah. casualty of transition this is good. Because I can't leave and go without leaving something behind. I can't go up and hold everything I used to hold. I can't be who God called me to be up here and still do what I did down here. This is heavy. It was supposed to be a smooth transition. It was supposed to go... From Samuel. He was old, just to saw, but he had to live a little longer yeah, until yeah, yeah. he could go find the right king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had to live a little yeah, longer yeah, yeah. until that could be a smooth transition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody in here, you chose a saw, but you need to go back, go back, go back. God is sending David. Yes, he is. The problem is, <laughs> correction, he already sent it. Already you overlooked him. Oh! That's heavy. He already oh said David. Oh he didn't look like Saul. Huh? He wasn't oh head God. above shoulder. He didn't look like he was supposed to be king. He wasn't Preaching striking it. and daring. And all the people looked at him. But David is here. You overlooked him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, it got quiet. Because now everybody's saying, who's David? Who's David? Who's David? Who's David? Because if you find David, you will recognize Saul. Because David is opposite of Saul. Come on. Jesus. This is him. Jesus. Jesus. 
Walk it out. Walk it out. Jesus. Jesus. Come on. 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 Go oh, and look at how they're sitting amongst your mist. Because you don't think they matter. <laughs> Just like David's daddy didn't feel him worthy to line him up in the number. You sitting there thinking they're not old enough. They're not experienced enough. But that's not what God needs. He needs their heart. Their heart. He said, Saul, when you were small in your own eyes. Prophesy. Saul fell mm. for what the people said. <laughs> the people said, Saul, you king. Saul, you look good. Saul, you look this way. Say, hey, king Saul. Hey, Saul. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Saul fell for it. Come on. Glory to right God. Right in his own eyes. When he was small in his own eyes. Glory to God. Right there, right there, right there. Right there. Right there. We don't really have time for no long tearing service. Because that's what I do. It ain't in my bye bye shot. I'll lay on the floor with you yeah, to yeah, you. Yeah. Hallelujah. But it don't take all that. We don't have to have it. But if you want another deposit, if you want to be prepared for the transition that God has for you, if you know you in transition, you belong at this altar. It'll be a point of contact between me, you, and the Lord that you don't miss the thing he causes you to drop. Oh. 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 Because that's how good God is. It'll hurt for a minute yes. if you look up and you don't even miss it. Hey. Yes. Yes. You don't even miss it. Did I, did I used to walk with them? Yeah, yeah, How yeah. Did that yeah. Happen? Come on, women. Did I used to date him? How did that happen? He wasn't even cute. How did that happen? You won't even miss it. Meet me at the altar if you believe the word of the Lord. Meet me at the altar if you believe.